Hi guys, welcome to another Monday Night Study. Tonight we wanted to go over a little bit of the history and a little bit of Gad chapter 1. So first off, let's just go through and, and look at this. In the Old Testament, there are uh, several prophets that are mentioned in the time of Solomon, or Samuel rather. So we have the books of First and Second Samuel. And in Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, it mentions Samuel was a prophet, that he wrote prophecy and history and stuff like that, and you need to read his books. His stuff was put in the canon. And so the question always arises, why does Chronicles, for instance, talk about there was a book of prophecy written by Gad, who was David's seer or David's prophet? And we know the history of some of the things Gad did in uh, Kings and Chronicles. And then there's Nathan and Ahijah and Shemaiah and Iddo and Samuel and things like that. So the question always arises, if they were real prophets that talked about real history and real prophecy, why weren't they put in the canon? And the reason is because God didn't want that to happen. Number one, you could have a prophet that's talking about localized prophecy or setting something up and it has nothing to do with us. So we wouldn't want to necessarily read it. So here, here's the thing. It's not that it's forbidden or anything, but the idea is if you had to read, you know, there's 66 books in the Bible. So that's intimidating for a lot of people. I have to study the Bible. It's going to take a while. What if it wasn't 66 books? What if it was 3,066 books? You would feel like, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even going to try. I'll never figure it out. It's just too much. And so what we want is a rule and guide of faith, which is our canon, to study. And in a sense, you really only have to study the New Testament to understand things, except for when Paul talks about uh, Abraham and Hagar, for instance, are a type of uh, symbol and because of this or that. And if you don't know who Hagar was or who Abraham was, you're lost. You have no, no clue on any of this stuff. And uh, let me change something real quick. I just realized I had a, a problem with um, something here. There we go. No, that's not the right one. Okay, anyway, I'm having a... That's, yeah, good enough. All right, let's see here. Okay, let's just continue. <laughs> My uh, things aren't quite right. Um, so anyway, you you need the, the New Testament. You need to understand the Old Testament to be able to figure things out. But these other prophets have prophecies in them, and sometimes they are for uh, end-time prophecy. And so that's what we want to look at as Gad. Now, the history of these, for instance, it's called the Lost Five. We have Samuel. We have uh, First and Second Samuel. Uh, we, we divide it as 1st and 2nd Samuel, but there's actually uh, some Bibles that just have the book of Samuel. So that makes it huge. But the history basically is that we have Gad, Ahijah, Shemaiah, and Iddo, along with, and Nathan, along with Samuel. But they were not put in the canon because they were apparently not supposed to. But these people... Uh, the, the records were kept by a group of Jews, to make a long story short, that uh, understood the prophecies of the ten tribes being taken by the Assyrians. And this is a great example of believing the Bible. If the Bible says something's going to happen, and then three or four generations later, the Assyrians are going to come, and anybody that's here is going to get carried off into slavery. Well, if you believe that, let's just not be here. God didn't say we had to be. It's just that's what's going to happen. So the people that don't believe prophecy get carried away into captivity. The people that believe pick up and move. Now, this group of Jews has had the lost five in their canon. They didn't have the rest of the canon because they got disconnected from Judaism. But basically, about 150 years ago, uh, the book of Gad was published because one of the Jewish people that had it became a believer in Messiah. 
And one of the deals is, if you don't understand Messiah's come, then you don't want people to know he's going to be born in Bethlehem, etc. They might try to kill him. So you keep some of the prophecies quiet. That'd be your responsibility. Once you realize Messiah came 2,000 years ago and it's all over, nothing is secret anymore. There's no reason to keep something like that secret. They don't understand Messiah's come, so they're still trying to hold on to that stuff. But he translated it into Dutch, and then it was into German, and then finally we were able to get it and put it in English a few years ago. So let's look at this, just a kind of an outline. So this is Gad, and this is our book. You can get it on Amazon, but um, it's mentioned in First Chronicles 29.29, 29, um, where it says the information that you might want to look at is written by Gad the seer and Nathan the prophet. So those are books that you might want to look at. And it's also alluded to in 1 Corinthians and in Galatians. But basically, let's just go through and look at an outline real quick. And it's divided into 14 chapters. So there's a, there's two visions. And then there's just some general history. There's a, there's a historical note about a certain Moabite. And then how David is wise, similar to the way Solomon would even at 12 years old would tell someone something and see what their reaction is and then catch them in a lie if they're a liar so very very wise and um there's several sermons of david which are really interesting uh a teaching on king hiram of tyre how they were noahides things like that two psalms uh david's death uh history of tamar which is a really amazing thing we should look at and then it ends with a picture of the Great Tribulation. And in that, you can very clearly see a pre-tribulational rapture, which is pretty interesting. So this is actually pr pretty straightforward. These two are kind of confusing. So I wanted to kind of just go over an overview, much like on Revelation, when we say Revelation is divided into chapters 1, 2, and 3, it's the church age. Four and five is kind of the introduction to the tribulation. And then six through 18, the bulk of the book, is the tribulation period. After which, in 19, you have the second coming. And in 20, you have the millennial reign. So you can kind of break it up like that. So we want, want to look at an overview. And then, for instance, if we wanted to study the, the um, tribulation period, we'd start in chapter six, just to kind of figure things out. Or if we want to make sure we don't miss anything, start at the bottom so we're going to look at this there's basically the first and the second vision so we're going to look at it but basically what happens is verses 1 through 4 of chapter 1 and then 53 through 62 are the story and the center part is the vision that he has but basically gad is doing something and he says like all the other prophets the word of the lord came to me well when the word of the lord comes to you that's a christophany so the messiah pre-incarnate appearance of messiah appeared to him basically said i want you to go to a certain place and you're going to see a vision when you're done i want you to go to king david because it's important for him to know this too you'll find king david sitting at a certain location reading a certain bible passage and you're going to tell him that I had this, I went there, I saw this vision, I was told to do this, now I'm here, and sure enough, you're here reading the scripture. And so it's going to let him know that this wasn't just a dream. A lot of times we put out fleeces, and sometimes that can look like it's good, and sometimes it can look like it's bad. And in, in a case like that, he's not looking for anything. He's sitting there reading the Bible somewhere where he's normally not, and the prophet just walks up. How did you know I was here? Well, I was told. So, and, and then he does this and David rejoices because it's obviously a thing of the Lord. And so, and then we want to, that's the outline. Then we want to look at the vision itself. The vision itself is a general outline of history. We'll see the first coming of Messiah and then a time period between the first and the second coming. And then the setting up of a kingdom age. And so it, that's really interesting. But we, we know that before we're in the middle of the church age so or toward the end of it. 
but what's interesting about it is there's this evil harlot system that is talked about and when we get to it we'll compare some other notes so just an overview tonight and then if you want to take it take it and read chapter one think about it and kind of compare so let's go through this if we look at the first vision this is gad chapter one it says in the 31st year of king david's reign in jerusalem which was the 38th year of king david's reign the word of the lord came to gad the seer in the month of er near the stream of the kidron valley and said something so this is remember king david was crowned king in hebron ruled for about seven years before he was able to take over the entire 10 tribe or 12 tribes and then he was re uh, crowned king of everything and so this happens a lot it'll be so many years after he was ruling for that first seven and then into the next section so this is the 31st year of king david's reign in jerusalem so it's nine years before he dies basically if he was 40. so the 31st year which our oh, excuse me which is the 38th year of his reign uh so the word of the lord that's the messiah pre-incarnate came to gad it's in the month of spring so er basically around the time of when the flood occurred um mid spring so our april may and so he told him he was in the kidron valley he came to him and told him this and he said thus says the lord go be courageous and stand in the midst of the stream and cry with a great voice terry hasten terry hasten terry hasten for there is still a vision for the son of jesse which is king david now terry means to slow down just wait a while see what happens hasten of course is to hurry up and get out of here before something happens so to terry and then hasten seems like a contradiction and there may be multiple things to this but at the very least the the concept for king david is to uh tarry your your kingdom is going to continue and it's going to hasten in the messiah and it may mean other things too but there is a vision or there's something god still wants to tell king david king david might be thinking well god did all this for me i've got the kingdom started and now many years from now the messiah will be here so i'll just hang out for a while and die and see what happens you know and so the lord's saying no actually there's still something left that you need to understand and basically the vision is going to tell him as far as king david's concerned that um um he's going to create this kingdom there's going to be a lot of problems the messiah is going to come there's going to be a lot of apostasy but in the end israel will still be here so that's something comforting it's not going to get bad enough that the lord's going to say wipe them out forget about it start over so you're going to see visions about the apostasy but know that it's not going to completely wipe out israel the messiah will fix things so this is this and it says during that cry face the eastern gate on the east side of the city stretch forth your hands to heaven and i did exactly what i had been commanded to do so the lord says i want you to go to the certain place you'll see a vision now we'll come back to that but let's go down to the bottom and we'll kind of see some things here when we get down to verse what I say 53 he sees this okay so 53 he sees this vision and then he says and I Gad the son of Ahimelech of the Jabez family of the tribe of Judah of the of Israel was amazed by this vision and I could not settle my spirit the same kind of language Daniel had when he saw things so first off understand Gad is of the Jabez family remember jabez the prayer of jabez was popular a few years ago 
He's a, a person of Judah. So Gad is from the tribe of Judah. He is Jewish. And incidentally, what's interesting is Nathan was a Gibeonite. So he was not Jewish. And that group of people are forbidden to ever convert to Judaism. And that shows us that you don't have to convert to Judaism to be saved. Jews are supposed to be Jews. Gentiles are supposed to be Gentiles. And that's just the way it's supposed to be. So, um, but, but that is pretty cool. You've got probably the one and only, as far as I know, Gentile prophet teaching David, the greatest of the Hebrew Jewish people, how to be a good ruler king of the Jews. So it's, it's interesting. Sometimes we'll get two replacement theology, or sometimes we'll get two Hebrew roots, and we'll b forget the fact that there's two different groups of people on this planet. Anyway, so he's saying, this is what I did. I was amazed. So here's what happens. So, and then verse 54, he says, the one dressed in linen came down to me. We see him in the vision. So he comes down to me and touched me and said, Write these words, seal them with the seal of truth, for I am who I am is my name. We see that in, in um, Exodus, when Moses is before the burning bush, and he says, well, if I go to tell the children of Israel that God of your fathers sent me, and I'm the one to free you, and this kind of stuff, they're going to ask, who? What's the name of the God of our fathers. So what do you want me to tell them? You know, what is your name? That kind of thing. And basically God says, I am who I am. King James says, I am that I am. Uh, I am the one that I am. He is everything. I mean, you can't say that he's the God of Hez Hezbon or the, the God of Jacob or just the God of Jerusalem or just the God of this. He's God of everything. But this is a, an interesting thing. So the actual name of God, the Tetragrammatron, as it's usually called, is I am who I am. That's my name. And with my name, you will bless the whole house of Israel. For they are of a true seed. Now, it doesn't say they are the one and only true seed. It says they are of a true seed. So there's Jews and Gentiles that both worship Messiah. Anyway, it goes on and says, in a little while, you will go and be quietly gathered to your fathers. So this might be one of the last things Gad saw. He was a prophet throughout all the stages of his life. Now it's going to say you're old. In a little while, just a few years or something, you will be gathered together with your fathers and die and be buried. But at the end of days, you will see with your own eyes all these things not as a vision but as reality so daniel was told the same thing it's like you you'll sleep with your fathers and you'll understand when you're resurrected at the end of days at the time of the resurrection it says for in those days they shall not be called jacob but israel for no iniquity will be found in their remnant. So just the ones that are left over. There's always iniquity in people, but in their remnant. For they will belong entirely to the Lord. And all these words will restore, these words rather, will restore your life and spirit. So there's a time of a resurrection. If you and I are believers in Messiah, we'll be resurrected also at that time, whenever that is. And this will be a sign to you. So now Gad's going to get specific instructions. Again, go to this spot, you'll see a vision, and then go tell the son of Jesse about it. This will be a sign to you. When you enter the town, you will find my servant David. While he is reading these words from the book of the covenant. And then they quote that this is a passage from Leviticus 26. David will be sitting at a certain spot, and he will be reading a certain verse, thinking about it, trying to figure it out. So this is a sign to you. The verse that he's reading will be, and yet for all that, when they're in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them, 
neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. So he's going to be reading this and you're going to be saying, well, actually, that's kind of what the Lord sent me. There's going to be these apostasies and these things that happen, but you don't have to worry about it. Evil people will be judged. There's evil Gentiles and there's evil Jews. We all know that. But Israel will be saved ultimately. You will tell him about the scene you've seen, the vision. And when he sees you, he will be glad in heart. So then Gad goes and sees, finds David. So as he came to pass, when I came to the house of David, the man of God, I found him. That's interesting that David was a man after God's own heart, the man of God. I found him as the one dressed in linen had said and told him all my visions, everything and all the details in it. And David spoke these words of his song to the Lord saying, I love you, O Lord, my strength. And he said to me, the Lord has blessed you and has not removed his covenant from you for he is true. His word is true, and his seal is true. So this was a few years before the death. So that's the storyline. So shorten it. Gad was visited by the Messiah, who said, go over there. You'll see a vision. Then I want you to go tell David about it. The sign will be, David will be reading this one scripture in this one place. This is where you'll find him. And when you tell him this, it'll it'll thrill his heart because it's not something you could have accidentally dreamed or accidentally saw if you drank too much or something is too specific. So that's it. That's chapters, chapter one, the first four verses and then verses 53 to 62. So now we'll go back and do an overview of the vision, not talk a whole lot about it, but just to kind of see what is it. So this is interesting. We'll see how far we get with it. So Okay, so he goes and he does what he said. He, he does exactly what he's commanded to do, and then he sees a vision. So let's look at this vision for a second. The vision starts off with a camel and a donkey. Now, camels and donkeys are unclean animals. So you wouldn't sacrifice them and you wouldn't eat them, but you, you still use them. But if far, as far as if something was a deer or a uh, ox, a cow, a bull, those are clean animals. You may or may not eat them. But if you saw something, if you had a dream, your cousin or family member was coming over and they were a big snake, you'd be like, well, that's evil. There's something wrong. That would be what the dream meant. So, but he sees this camel and this donkey. So they figure to be two false religious systems that lead people astray. Somehow they're back then, but we get to see how far they go. They're actually here. They can't be destroyed in some form. They're still here until the Messiah comes to set up the kingdom. That's just, that's all I want you to see tonight. And then we can try to figure this out because the camel and the donkey have something to do with the harlot church of Babylon. And we'll kind of connect those together. So he goes to the place where he's supposed to, and he sees this vision. And this is what he sees. It came to pass when I finished crying out, I opened my eyes and saw a yoke of oxen. So there's two oxes or two bulls or two cows, you know, uh, and they're yoked together like normal. So a yoke of oxen, but it's kind of odd. They're being led by a donkey and a camel. They're coming up from the Kidron stream, the valley where the stream is, the donkey on the right side, and the camel on the left. So if you look at a map, you'll see they're, they're coming a certain way. One's on the right, one's on the left. If they represent countries, the countries are over here and over here. And we'll, we'll come back to that when we figure out who they are. So basically the ox, if you've figured it out the two oxes are Israel and Judah so it's Israel you know the nation being led by two 
stupid religious groups that are legalist or liberals or something like that or pagans or something so this is what he sees then he says a great voice like the roll of thunder was following them crying with a bitter voice and this is what the voice said seer 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 now this is a, a seer is an old word for prophet get as a seer or a prophet but you'll see these in in threes a lot and in my mind what you're saying is he's seeing this vision and he hears this voice from somewhere seer 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 look it's almost like the trinity is there father son and holy spirit yeah, each one of them saying hey look pay attention this part seer 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 there are four mixtures that confuse the people of the lord so a mixture is is something you might have water and you might have milk milk is good for you water is good for you but i wouldn't water down milk i mean it might not hurt you but it's just why you know there's mixtures that really shouldn't be mixtures so there's four mixtures that confuse the people of the lord for the impure and the pure have been mixed this is important for us because um the lord says we're not supposed to and the scrolls say this over and over again we're supposed to discriminate we're not supposed to mingle with people that could cause problems or evil people we're supposed to witness to them we're supposed to try to help them in such a way as to get them to come to the lord but you got to be careful and if you just run this down just basic what parent would allow their daughter to go out with a guy that you know is not a good guy he's got a really bad reputation what parent would let their their teenage son hang out with somebody that you know is part of a gang and has been in prison or or something like that this kind of a thing why would you let your kid play with someone go somewhere go to a school where they're going to be taught anti-christian values and promoting some weird thing so we wouldn't want to do that we'd we would want to discriminate so to speak in that and so we would call that impure because if i let my son hang out with this guy he's going to think it's cool he's going to join the gang and he's either going to wind up dead or in prison or on drugs or all the above the same with the daughter and that kind of stuff uh, so there's pure and there's impure and you got to be careful so the pure have mixed with the pure probably under the guise of helping people or seeing what happens then and then impurity took control over purity a mixture from seer which is edom to rule over them and i think this is a, a an embedded prophecy about uh herod was an edomite and he was ruling over israel making things very impure at the time of the messiah's coming may have something to do with something else too because edom or seer is also a word that that um, has something to do with rome like the old roman empire so anyway it goes on to increase power over and betray a righteous doer herod definitely did that to the messiah um, and evil always does that to good to destroy holiness and to crown wickedness and to set up impure matters in a guise of impurity so what he's saying if we take this and we put it in our time period what's going to happen is someone's going to come along and say yes they're disgusting you know the drug dealers the this the that and the other thing but they're people we need to help them maybe some of them are evil maybe some of them just got caught up in whatever so yes that's not the desirable outcome they should be like us but we will tolerate them okay and then from that time forth what happens is um instead of repenting and the person messed up in drugs pornography uh, sex uh, alcohol whatever uh, the person really messed up instead of it saying you know i've done this wrong this is all backwards 
I'm going to repent and become like you. I'm going to follow the Lord and get rid of these things. My life will be much better. That's what's supposed to happen. And that's what would happen if we'd say, you can get out of this. And if you want to get out of this, I'll help you. But you have to want to get out of it. I'm just not going to give you money or take care of problems because you'll go right back into it. You've got to decide, I don't want the drugs anymore. And I will die before I do the drugs again. You've, you've got to make that kind of a decision. But when you don't, then all of a sudden, it's like, well, you're judging me. I'm just as good as you. I just happen to choose a different path. Maybe my path is not as good as yours. Maybe it is, but don't judge me. So you've taken the good and the evil, and now they have taken it and made it a little even. Now, the next phase on this is that they begin to say, well, um, it's always been that way. Instead, it's you're saying I was evil and you're good. I'm saying it's always been that it's just a choice. It doesn't matter. Then all of a sudden they flip it around a little bit further. The fourth one is set up impure manners in a guise of purity. So then they start saying something like, hey, the fornication, the sex, the drugs, the alcohol, it's actually a good thing. And you guys are the perverted ones. So we go from, okay, I'm bad, but you have to tolerate me to, hey, I'm just as good as you are and you have to tolerate me. And then we get to, hey, you think you, you've always been this way, but it's actually always been that I'm good and you're bad, but I tolerate you. But mind your manners. And then it's, they start persecuting us. And so this is this guise of, of holiness and impurity. So we have to be careful of this. Paul, well, actually the, the whole New Testament talks about um, you don't allow impure people to affect your home and your, your church. That's why we have excommunication for people that will not follow directions. Um, and that should be only in an extreme. But we have to protect our people, which is what he's talking about here. I mean, how many of us, if we went to church and noticed that the pastor and the deacons were drunk because they had a little too much of the communion wine, or we come to find out that someone working in the children's department is a known pedophile, and you go ask the, the pastor, did you know this? No. How did you find out? Well, you're supposed to vent people, right? Vet, not vent. You're supposed to vet people. Uh, you should have checked him out. That's it's If he's been convicted of a robbery, of, of anything, there'd be a criminal record. That's a public record. And if you're going to allow him to work for you, you make sure he's not a known thief before you let him work with the tithe money. You make sure he's not a pedophile before he works with the children's department. You just protect your family. So it's very, very important. So we got to guard against impurity. Anybody can repent. And if they truly repent, become a Christian, the old stuff is forgotten. But we can't allow impurity to be mixed with purity. Very, very important. And that is a hundred different things. Specifically, one thing for King David. Uh, so we'll come back and look at these again later, but this is kind of an overview. Let me just go through the rest of it kind of quickly because I just want to point out one other thing to you. So first off, he sees the Messiah come, say that there's a vision, go look and then go tell David. He goes there and he sees two oxen that are being yoked. They're being led by a camel and a donkey. Very odd. And then, he's get, then he gets this lecture about purity and impurity and how they change. Make sure they don't change. That's the four mixtures. And then he has this vision, something about a moon kingdom. So he sees something, and let me, uh, well, I think you see it on this, but the picture, the main picture is you're, you're looking east, you see the, the um, eastern gate, and above the eastern gate you see the sun and the moon but the sun and the moon have symbols and stuff in them. So it says, after the voice, a great earthquake or quake occurred that shook over the impurity and blew the donkey and the camel into the moon with a stormy wind. So there's a sun and a moon, 
he's looking down here, this camel, the donkey, and the oxen. There's this quake, this wind that comes up, and it has to do with getting rid of impurity. And it blows the camel and the donkey all the way to the moon. The oxen are still sitting there. So there's some, some sort of purge. The moon was opened, and it looked like a bow, a semicircle. Both her points reached toward the ground. So you can think of the symbol of Islam, except Islam is usually tilted this way, and maybe there's a star in the center, but it's like this. Instead of a crescent moon like this, it's a crescent moon with both points pointing down. And that means something very important. And lo, the sun came out of heaven in the shape of a man with a crown on his head. Carrying over his right shoulder was a lamb despised and rejected. It's interesting because if Gad wrote this, this would be 1000 BC. Isaiah writing Isaiah 53 would be seven to 800 BC, at least a couple hundred years later. Who's quoting from who? So there's God the Father, apparently, this coming out of the sun in the shape of a man, and he's got a lamb despised and rejected over his right shoulder. I think we know who the lamb would be despised and rejected. That'd be the Messiah. On his crown, and I'm assuming this is talking about God the Father, the guy that's carrying the lamb rather than the lamb, but since it's a trinity, it doesn't matter a whole lot. But on the crown, he's crowned. He had On his crown were three shepherds shackled with 12 shackles. These were shackles of gold plated with silver. We're not going to get into what would they might mean, but this is the symbol. Okay, here we go. So here's the guy in the sun with the lamb over his shoulder. And here's the moon that's a crescent moon with its points pointing down. And the donkey and the camel have been blown away. And now they're here in this crescent moon. And so, uh, and this is a vision being seen over the Eastern Gate. So this represents the kingdom of God in heaven and the kingdom of God on earth. Israel is supposed to always be a reflection of God on earth. But anyway, let's just go on. The voice of the lamb was heard, great and dreadful, like the voice of a lion roaring over its prey. So this lamb is also a lion. I think that's very logical, very typological for scriptures. Messiah is both the lion of the tribe of Judah and that. So we'll just read through this fast and you can read about it and think about it. And we'll come back and study it next week. But it says, woe to me, woe unto me, woe unto me. There's the three again. My image has been diminished. My refuge has been lost. My lot and destiny has turned me over to my spoilers. And I was defiled until the evening by the touch of impurity. Now the Messiah in his first coming hangs on a cross. It is a touch of impurity. He becomes unclean by the people that spoiled him. So, and that's actually technically us. He, his sins are on, or our sins are on him. But it says, it came to pass when the voice of the lamb ceased speaking, a man dressed in linen came with three vine branches and 12 palms in his hand. Now, again, that's, we'll come back and look at that later. He took the lamb from the hand of the sun. So the, the man that's in the sun, he took the lamb from it and put the crown on his head and the vine branches and the palms on his heart. If you think about it, we can figure out this, the symbolism for this. And the man dressed in linen cried like a ram's horn, saying, What are you doing here, impurity? How did you get here, impurity? What have you carved your, or that you have carved yourself a place to combine impurity with my covenant that I have set with the vine branches and the palms? So there's a covenant covenant of grace, a covenant of redemption, a covenant of salvation for the palm branches and the vines. But there's impure something in it. How in the world would Israel, having everything that God has, wind up messing up and becoming pagan, you know, and then getting kicked out into Babylon and stuff like that? How would that even be possible? 
piece by piece, impurity mixes with impure with purity, and we're told how it happens up there. We just read that, the four stages. So how does this happen? And then it says, I heard the lamb's shepherd. So the lamb's shepherd would be the guy, I think, that he came from, saying, there is a place with me for the pure, but not for the impure. For I am a holy God and do not want the impure. I want only the pure. Even though I created them both, and my eyes are equally on them both, but there's an advantage to being have an abundance of purity over an abundance of impurity. We can understand that. It's just like there's an advantage of a man over a shadow. A shadow looks like a man, but it's empty. A man has substance. The shadow does not exist without the man, but only by the man's existence is the shadow given to the tired and the exhausted. So this is a very complicated prophecy or riddle. Uh, this applies in the same way to both the pure and the impure. Impurity would not exist without everything like it is or like it's supposed to be. You'd have to take what's pure and twist it. So impurity cannot exist without purity. For all the gates of intelligence are turned around since the death of the eight branches of the vine. That's a really interesting clue there, which we will skip over. So as for the words of the righteous in the true book, <coughs> uh, but because of the wanderings of the sheep, their rest and their divisions, intelligence is stopped up until I do greatly in keeping grace. So in his day, they get apostatized, they get confused until the coming. In the church age, we're confused. How many denominations do we have? And it's not just because you want to witness and work with people on that coast, and I'm in the center of the country, and they're over here, and be better for them to work with the people closer to them. It's not just things like that. We divide over doctrine. How is that even possible? Who's mixing purity with impurity? Who can't understand what's pure and what's impure? It's not that hard, but we have hundreds of denominations. Interesting. And here's the Messianic kingdom. I saw, uh, at that point then, I saw impurity was driven from the moon. So in other words, impurity is there with the camel and the donkey. It gets blown to the moon. Messiah comes, dies for our sins. And then the impurity in the moon gets driven from the moon. And given over to a consuming wrath ground into fine dust and blown away by the daily wind as the day burns a furnace or and the day burns as a furnace to remove impurity and to ease transgressions the lamb was put on the moon forever and ever the lamb took from the pure the impurity that had been mixed with them and brought it a peace offering, sacrificed to the altar before El Shaddai, jealous before the Lord of hosts. And I heard the those singing the song of the Lamb. And this is the song of what they call the redeemed. We have a piece of this in Revelation. Very interesting. So the song of the redeemed. When the Messiah came the first time, he created the redeemed. And they're mentioned again in chapter 14. We're the ones that are sinners, wicked sinners, just like everybody else. But because we trusted Messiah, somehow he took the impurity away. And so we are the redeemed. We're people that still have a problem. We struggle with sin nature, but we try not to do it. The attitude is the big part. I won't read this. We'll come back to it later. Um, let's see here. Let me go on down here. And then that's that's where it ends. Well, let me show you this now. So this is the point that I wanted to, to stress. So if stringing this together, Gad sees a vision. And the vision is, here's this two oxen. That's Israel. Uh, we could say it's the church. It's the sheep, you know, sheeple, who will just do what they're told. 
uh, they're being guided by these false prophets, false groups, false pastors, false kings. So these people perverting them. And they just go along because that's what they're told. They have no discernment because they don't read scripture. But he sees this vision. All of a sudden, they are blown to the moon. Okay. Then the Messiah appears. He comes down and he is killed. Uh, for us and creates the redeemed. Okay. Then he goes back to the father. We can see that later. But then he comes and destroys the moon kingdom and is there forever. So you can see in this two comings. You can see the Messiah, Israel doing stuff before, Messiah coming, dying for our sins, going back to God, coming back and fixing the moon kingdom, and then creating a kingdom that's there forever. That's the second coming millennial reign. So we know all that, that structure from prophecy. But the interesting part is this camel donkey problem, whatever it is that mixes purity with impurity in different ways throughout the centuries, was way back then. Before Messiah came, it exists in Israel to mess them up. Messiah came and created the redeemed, went back. And then when he comes back again, the second coming, camel and the donkey are still here we can't get rid of the camel and the donkey we can't fix problems apparently not in revelation we have a harlot system and again impurity in your church you should be able to spot it and kick it out so why can't everybody well somehow it doesn't there's an apostasy but in revelation it's called the harlot babylon system it's a false religious system uh, that looks like the church. It looks like the, the symbolism. So if Messiah comes, first coming, goes back, comes back, fixes the, or sets up the kingdom, and the camel and the donkey has been here all along and is still here at the second coming, what kind of system is that? It's the Babylonian mystery religion, which we'll see other pieces. When we get into chapter two, it basically flat out tells you who it is and what to look for. At, at the end but this i just wanted to show you this to get the idea that it's a system all the way through so if you knew what babylon was right now you'd be tempted to go destroy it but i don't care who you are or what powers you have you won't be able to it's kind of like us saying if i could figure out who the antichrist was i could go kill him before he becomes an adult well yeah that'd be nice but prophecy shows that it's not going to happen. Nobody can go back in time and get rid of Hitler before Hitler killed all the Jews, you know, the Holocaust and stuff. Prophecy, it's not that God wants it to happen. Prophecy is just telling you what happens. So if you know it's going to happen, you don't want to come against it because you'll just destroy yourself. But point being, we need to look for these things. So this mystery Babylon it's not just Babylon of old that's been destroyed and it's no longer here. Mystery Babylon has kind of sort of been all the way through. And it will come full force in the near future. The camel and the donkey has always been kind of here. But will come full force in the near future. So the camel and the donkey somehow help or are Babylon. Very, very interesting. And the practical side. We don't mix impurity with purity very very important now, since we all have a sin nature i'm going to like certain things you do and not like certain things you do and that's you can't use my opinions to know what's right and wrong because i have a sin nature too i could be messed up so the only thing we can do is compare it with scripture be silent when the scripture is silent but when the scripture speaks speak don't say well that's probably mistranslated Hundreds or thousands of people that know more languages than you and I put together have always said it's translated the same way. So you don't have to worry about it. We'll stop here at this point. It's kind of an outline of chapter one.